So let's jump right in. Uh, how do the vaccines work? Well, generally, uh, as you all know, there's four vaccines that have been licensed in Canada. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine initially, then Moderna, uh, followed by AstraZeneca, and then the, the Johnson Johnson vaccine. The Johnson Johnson vaccine has not landed in Canada yet. We're still waiting on it. The initial expectations uh, were the end of April, but that might get pushed back. Uh, so we really are working with, with free vaccines here in Ontario. Um, how do they work? Well, they generally work all work um, in the same way in that they teach the body how to recognize the virus before you become infected. Uh, so that once you become infected, your immune system recognizes it and will help to uh, fight off any infection. So um, in general principles, all vaccines out there right now, the four we, we, that have been licensed in Canada and other vaccines across the world, all work by teaching your body how to produce an immune response to something called the spike protein. Now, the spike protein is actually on the outside of the virus itself. Um, the vaccines we have in Canada right now teach the body how to produce that spike protein. That spike protein is manifested on the surface of cells. And then uh, your body sees it and uh, creates an immune response to it. Um, then if we're ever infected with the virus, which actually has the spike protein, the immune system is primed and is able to fight it off. All right. Um, one question we frequently get asked is, well, look, if we're, we're actually getting these vaccines, can we get COVID-19 from the vaccine? And the answer is clearly no. OK, remember, the vaccines do not contain the whole virus. They're, they create the instructions for your body to produce that spike protein. Right now, remember, sometimes when we when we get vaccinated, we get symptoms that are very similar to what we would get if we got mild COVID. Right. So muscle aches, uh, fever. Um, you know, uh, uh, just feeling unwell. A um, couple of things that are important to recognize. Those are side effects, but they're side effects that are actually telling us that the body's immune system is reacting. So although you might not feel great, it's not the worst thing. Uh, and, and those side effects, as we'll speak about, are often transient. The other thing to remember is after we're vaccinated, it can take, uh, it really does take about two weeks for the vaccine to become effective. So if you do get fever, even after vaccination, it is really important, fever or any other symptom that may be consistent with COVID, it's important to rule out COVID, right? And that sometimes warrants getting tested, all right? Um, okay, the, 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 the main reason we take the vaccine is for effectiveness. So I just wanna review a little bit of the data around how do these vaccines actually work and how do we know they work? So we know they work because there's been really large clinical trials uh, that have looked at the effectiveness of these vaccines. So I'm going to go through them with you. I'm going to share a little bit of data, which might be boring for some, but hopefully instructive for others. Um, so th these are the large studies uh, on which the Pfizer and uh, Pfizer Biotech and the Moderna vaccines were actually approved. So you can see these are huge studies, 40,000 participants in the Pfizer study, over 30,000 in the Moderna study, uh, looking at adults. So Moderna over 18 years of age, Pfizer over 16 years of age. And I draw your attention to the interval between doses. I know this will come up and something we should talk about. In these studies, the Pfizer uh, trial, the interval between the doses was 21 days. On the Moderna trial, it was 28 days. Okay, and remember, how do these studies work? Well, they they recruit people. Half the people get a vaccine that's a COVID vaccine. Half get an injection that's not a COVID vaccine. Sometimes it's another vaccine, and then they follow people to see uh, what are the rates of people getting infection after vaccination. So, what did they find? Uh, well, quite incredibly, and this again far exceeded our wildest expectations. Uh, both these vaccines were about 95% effective um, uh, after the second dose, right? And that, that effectiveness was consistent across age, gender, race, and ethnicity. You know, I think most of us felt, uh, if we'd gone back six or seven months, that if there was a vaccine that was 50, 60% effective, we'd be thrilled with that. Uh, so this, this was fantastic news, over 95%. Now, what about these other vaccines, the, the ones that came later, the AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson trial? Um, they, they also have published very large clinical trials, AstraZeneca over 30,000 participants. Uh, in a recent trial that, was, uh, the, that uh, took place in the United States, and I preface it because you might hear of 
another trial that AstraZeneca did uh, that was in the UK and in Brazil that was published a couple of months ago. Um, to me, the, the recent US trial was much cleaner, much better trial. Uh, so I, I've listed the data from that trial. And then the Johnson & Johnson trial, which had over 40,000 participants. Both of these vaccine, vaccine trials were in people over 18 years of age. AstraZeneca, um, their, their interval between doses was generally four weeks, sometimes longer. And what's interesting about Johnson & Johnson is it's a single dose vaccine, one shot. Right now, how effective are these vaccines? Well, AstraZeneca came in at 76 percent. Uh, the Johnson Johnson uh, numbers are a little bit different. Um, the the trial took place in, in a number of regions, and uh, the effectiveness varied. Um, now, it varied primarily, uh, we think, because of the variants. So there were less variants in the United States at the time this trial took place. There were many more variants, of course, in South Africa. Uh, and what was encouraging is Johnson Johnson is able to show that uh, they have some impact on that variant that was that was quite common in South Africa. Now, people will say, look, 94, 95 percent for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Look at these numbers. They're in the 70s, sometimes in the 60s. Um, it's really hard to compare. Right? It's really hard to compare because remember, these, these studies took place in different countries, but more importantly, at different times. So the, the, the Pfizer and Moderna trials took place last summer where there really weren't a lot of circulating variants. Uh, the AstraZeneca trials it went into 2021 where there were a lot more circulating variants. So, um, you know, difficult to say, right? Whether uh, these vaccines, these, I mean, these numbers are lower, but how would, how would Pfizer and Moderna do if they, uh, if they were actually trialed right now? And although we're getting information on, on effectiveness in real world setting, uh, it probably isn't um, really instructive to, to compare these vaccines based on these clinical trials. So something to remember. When we look at severe illness, right, hospitalizations, uh, which really is the most important thing, uh, we can see that all of these vaccines are nearly 100% effective. In effect, are 100% effective. There was one uh, person in the Moderna trial, and it's a bit confusing that they tested positive and then tested negative, but we include that number in our calculation just to, to be completely accurate. But really, if you are vaccinated with these vaccines, uh, there is increasing evidence that they are highly effective in, produce, in preventing uh, severe illness, right? Which is really uh, one of the things we should be most reassured about. Now, these are vaccine trials, right? So th these are in particular settings. You know, I think just as important to us um, is how, how, have, how have these, these vaccines been um, working in the real world setting? And this to me is the most compelling evidence, right? Now this, excuse me, I'm throwing more numbers at you. I promised I wouldn't uh, send more, but this is a, a, a graph that I've cut and pasted from some of the Ministry of Health data. And this is a active long-term cases, okay? And I draw your attention to these numbers, right? So we are at over 1,600 cases of residents in long-term care uh, three months ago, right? So January 14th, this was sort of the peak in that second wave, uh, 1,650 cases. Now, remember, uh, that was the first place we went in and vaccinated. Mostly Pfizer vaccine at that time, sometimes Moderna vaccine. Um, people got their two shots. And uh, initially, we started to see cases go down. We thought, well, you know what? They're going down everywhere, right? So it's hard to say whether this is particular to the vaccine. But as you all know, numbers are skyrocketing across Ontario. Uh, today's numbers, I hate to say it, we've crossed 4,000 cases, right? Uh, so numbers are skyrocketing. How many cases are there in long-term care? Um, as of April 7th, there were 10, 10 cases. Right. And you can see these are the numbers over the last week, right, of, of residents in long term care where over 90 percent of people were, were vaccinated. This to me is incredibly compelling. Right. Long term care was really ground zero. Um, tremendous number of deaths. Uh, we all remember those horrific stories of people who are incredibly ill. We know in elderly people, their immune system tends not to be as strong as people who are younger, but nevertheless, with two doses of, of, of vaccine, uh, it is pretty much gone in residents in long-term care. In healthcare workers in long-term care, it has also dropped dramatically, sorry, um, but not as much. And that probably has to do with rates of vaccinations not being so high. We know we're over 90% 
in uh, in in residents. Uh, we are not nearly close to that in uh, in health in workers. We're probably provincially at 75%, and might very well be lower here in Toronto. And again, it speaks to the work we need to do to share some of this information to make sure that people are making informed decisions. What about globally? Well, re really, as you all know, the leader in terms of vaccinations globally has been Israel. It's a small country. They had lots of vaccines and they are sitting in cafes in Israel right now because the numbers have plummeted. And if you look at active cases, if you look at this graph and many other countries across the world, uh, you can see there is a rise in third and fourth waves uh, in in the vast majority of countries. This appeared in Israel. The other country that's probably number two in terms of vaccination is the UK. And again, although they had a horrible wave in January, uh, their numbers have also dissipated. Now, I'm not saying that's all vaccine, right? We know in the UK, uh, there's been lockdowns, um, there's other public health measures, uh, but it is really encouraging. In those countries that have been able to vaccinate large percentages of their population, uh, they are not seeing this, these tremendous rise in cases that we're seeing here in Ontario. What are we still learning about these variants? Well, we're starting to get more and more and more data on how effective the uh, vaccines are, are against the new variants. Uh, we know the variant that's circulating in Ontario is this B117. You might have heard the, the term that, that came out of the UK. It was first identified in the UK. Uh, we know that all the vaccines have shown good effectiveness against B117. We have less data on the strains that have come out of Brazil and the strain that's come out of South Africa. As I mentioned, Johnson Johnson has some data. Uh, there's some good lab data that's encouraging, but uh, the data is not nearly as robust. We also don't know how long the vaccine is gonna provide immune protection. Remember globally, the vaccine rolled out in December. Uh, so, you know, and, and in many countries and with some of the vaccines, it was much later. So will, will these vaccines be effective for a year or two years or five years or six months? We don't know. And uh, I think many people feel that we'll need a booster dose, not only because immunity will wane, which it may not, but because the virus will be changing with these mutants. And already there's been uh, uh, most of the, uh, I know Pfizer and Moderna are both um, looking at modifying their vaccine uh, to deal with these new variants. And then, you know, the third question we have on here is do the vaccines prevent spread of COVID-19? I think I can say pretty convincingly now the data is starting to roll in and absolutely we are. So, so here's the scenario. We know it prevents people from getting sick. We know it prevents people from getting very sick. We know it prevents people from getting even mild to moderate illness in most cases. Um, do we know that it'll prevent asymptomatic uh, carriage of the virus. We know some some conditions people are very mild, sometimes no symptoms, and they can still transmit it. The data is starting to come in saying that yes, absolutely, they will be effective as well in preventing us from carrying it asymptomatically and transmitting it. Um, so although you know we can't say that as is uh, uh, an absolute fact right now, but I think most of us are really encouraged by the data we're seeing.